previously on Trumpet with Bob. In our first episode, we discussed the mechanics of how the trumpet itself makes sound. And in this episode, we're going to talk about the way that our bodies work in order to allow us to coax beautiful music out of this brass plumbing. Breathing is a two-part process. Inhalation is an active process. Exhalation tends to be a passive process, much like the air escaping from this balloon. Now, as trumpet players, we can make exhalation an active process rather than a passive process by engaging our abdominal muscles and our external obliques to add extra force and to push that air out of our lungs into the atmosphere. All right, now that we've got a handle on the way that we use our air to power this machine, we can get into the way that our body works when changing pitch on the trumpet. It's clear that we have to change the frequency of our lips in order to be able to access these various harmonics across the range of the trumpet. However, the way that we change the frequency of our lips is where things start to get really interesting and a little bit mysterious. The first factor that influences the frequency of our lips is the tension or stiffness of our lips. The second factor that influences the frequency of our lips is the size of the aperture. The third factor influencing the pitch of our lips is the area of our lips that is vibrating. All right, the fourth factor that we use to alter the frequency of our lips is the air pressure. Finally, that brings us to our fifth and most controversial factor, and that is the position of your tongue inside of your mouth. All right, and this brings us to the final and most controversial factor in changing pitch on the trumpet, the tongue's roll. Now, it has seemed to me intuitively clear for a long time that the tongue has a very useful role to play in changing registers on the trumpet and perhaps an essential role in maintaining high notes uh, in the upper register of the trumpet. Now, this is best explained by changing vowel sounds from ah, where the tongue is low in the mouth, to e, where the tongue gets higher in the mouth, closer to the palate, thus reducing the space through which the air can move, changing the airflow, thus manipulating the pitch of the instrument. Now, this concept and explaining it in certain ways has been extremely useful for all of my students, especially in the beginning stages of learning to play the trumpet, where changing registers can be a sort of mysterious thing. So uh, I've found in almost all cases that just thinking about those vowel sounds to move the tongue in the head uh, really helps in expediting the process of learning how to change registers on the trumpet. This was also the basis for my video, Don't Tighten Your Lips to Play High Notes. Now, I'm not the only one who feels this way about the positioning of the tongue. Many brass teachers teach this way. And in particular, in famed trumpeter Claude Gordon's uh, very excellent but perhaps misleadingly titled Brass Playing is No Harder Than Deep Breathing, Mr. Gordon says the following. If there ever was a secret to brass playing, it is the tongue. He then goes on to fill a chapter with just the various uh, approaches to using the tongue to change the registers. And in particular, he makes the argument that every note on the trumpet has a particular tongue position required to hit that note exactly where you need to. Uh, for Claude Gordon, the air support and the tongue position was 100% of uh, what he saw as being the way that we change the pitch on the trumpet. So, from a physics perspective, what does your tongue do to affect the pitch on the trumpet? Well, after some substantial research, I was surprised to find that nobody knows. It remains a scientific mystery. As a matter of fact, given the lack of hard evidence showing what the tongue does to change the pitch, a lot of well-qualified physicists and brass instructors have concluded that the tongue does absolutely nothing to change the pitch. Now, I'm not so sure about that, so we're going to go through a couple of the most commonly cited hypotheses explaining what the tongue does to change the pitch of the instrument, as well as the possibility that the tongue does absolutely nothing to change the pitch, and then I will give my own reflection on the issue. Our first hypothesis seems to me to be the most common explanation among trumpet players, and it is the explanation favored by Ben Peterson in his book Trumpet Science, and it goes like this. As we move the vowels from ah to e in our mouth, we're moving the tongue up in our heads. That space in our mouth is decreased by the position of our tongue, thus increasing the speed of the air at our lips, which in turn increases the frequency of our lips. Now, this involves two concepts in fluid dynamics. 
One is Bernoulli's principle, and the other is the Venturi effect. Bernoulli's principle is named after 18th century mathematician and physicist Daniel Bernoulli, and the principle states that an increase in velocity of a fluid will correlate with a decrease in static pressure. Now, one commonly cited example of the Bernoulli principle is an airplane wing, in which the airplane wing is shaped in such a way that as the airplane moves forward, the air on top of the wing necessarily has to move faster than the air on the bottom of the wing to get to the same place at the same time. Thus, the increased velocity of the air over the wing causes a decrease in pressure in relation to the air under the wing, thus causing lift, which allows us to fly through the air like a bird in a 200-ton metal machine. The second closely related concept is the Venturi effect, named after 18th century Italian physicist Giovanni Venturi. The Venturi effect states that as a fluid moves through a restricted area in a pipe, the velocity of the fluid will increase as the static pressure decreases. All right, so in this first hypothesis, when we move the vowel sound from the ah to the e, moving our tongue up in our mouths, that is going to create a Venturi by reducing the space in our mouths through which the air can move, therefore increasing the velocity of the air. Now, I think this is a uh, common example or common explanation for trumpet players because of its simplicity and also because it intuitively feels as though that air is moving faster in our mouths. However, there are a couple of problems with this that I think are worth addressing. Number one, in order for the Venturi effect to cause the air to be moving at max speed at the point of our lips, our tongues would have to be up throughout our entire oral cavity rather than just a section of it. That is to say, the way that the Venturi effect works is the air is only going to increase in velocity at that point where the pipe is restricted. So <clears throat> if our tongues are up in our heads from the point of the middle of our mouths all the way to our lips, conceivably we could use that Venturi effect. But if only the middle or back of the tongue is raised, then by the time the air reaches where our lips are in the front of our mouths, the air speed will have returned to its original velocity. The second kind of tricky issue with the Venturi effect hypothesis is that when the space is restricted in our oral cavities, we can assume that even if the velocity of the air were to increase, the pressure would decrease. So if we're using air pressure from our abdominal muscles in order to increase the pitch, it would seem counterintuitive that then the Venturi effect would also cause the air pressure in our mouths to decrease. Now that being said, I think that there's probably a way that we could intuitively or unconsciously overcome this as trumpet players by just adding additional pressure from our lungs and that may compensate for the lower pressure uh, given the Venturi effect. All right, so there's a couple little problems with the Venturi effect hypothesis. However, I'm not ready to dispense with it wholesale just yet. In particular, there seems to be evidence to show, first of all, that just about every trumpet player will move his or her tongue up in the mouth in order to play in the extreme upper register of the trumpet. And in doing so, it does stand to reason that the tongue would be able to funnel the air quickly towards the back of the lips, provided that there wasn't a change in the restriction of the oral cavity before the airstream got to the lips. Now that being said, we are left without a solid conclusion on the Venturi effect hypothesis. So from there, let's move on to our second hypothesis. The use of the tongue in changing the pitch on trumpet is often compared with the use of the tongue when changing pitches whistling. When whistling, we use our tongue to change the resonance of our oral cavity in order to change the pitch. Not unlike the way we can change the pitch in a bottle of liquid by reducing the liquid, thus increasing the resonant area inside the bottle. So is it possible then that we are changing the pitch of the trumpet by changing the resonance in our oral cavities? 
Well, fortunately for us, in around 2010, the University of New South Wales in Australia did an experiment, did a study on this very subject, starting with the fact that saxophonists and clarinetists are known to alter their vocal tract in order to change the resonance of the vocal tract in order to access notes in the altissimo range of the saxophone and clarinet. So the researchers at the University of New South Wales studied whether trumpet players and brass players in general also use an, a tuning of the vocal tract in order to be able to access the various harmonics on the trumpet. This study is very interesting and it sheds some light on the way that the trumpet works and I'll put a link to it in the description below with the other books that I've been reading and the studies that I've been looking at. But I'll take a little time now to read to you a part of the conclusion of the study. And it goes like this. Players can produce a vocal tract resonance with peaks in impedance comparable with those of the trumpet bore for the highest range of the instrument. This study shows, however, that players can play above 1 kilohertz and as high as 1.5 kilohertz, uh, that's about a high C sharp to a double high G sharp, without having to tune their vocal tract resonances. Indeed, under the conditions of these measurements, the players in the study were not seen to tune the tract resonance in a systematic way for normal playing, high note playing, or during pitch bending. Further, the considerable variation in the resonance frequencies used by different players suggests that the seven players in this study used very different vocal tract configurations over the playing range. Like the saxophone, the trumpet has weak impedance peaks in its highest range. However, while saxophone players can only use this range by tuning their tract resonances, the trumpet players of this study can play in the high range without tuning resonances. So, can we conclude that trumpet players do not tune their vocal tracts in order to reach the higher notes? Not really, because in uh, this particular study, one thing that they found was that the impedance head, which is the measuring device that they used, uh, to put into the mouths of the trumpet players caused it to be impossible for them to play up into their highest range. So each of the trumpet players with this measuring device, the impedance head in their mouths while they were playing, lost a little bit of their range. And uh, that may have interfered a little bit with the possibility of measuring whether the vocal tract is tuned in the extreme upper register. Furthermore, one of the interesting um, conclusions that the researchers drew was, and I quote, all reported that they raised their tongues to reach the very highest notes. Okay, with another somewhat mysterious conclusion, let's move on to our third hypothesis, and that is that the tongue does absolutely nothing to change the pitch of the trumpet. In this hypothesis, using the tongue to change pitch is entirely just ridiculous snake oil, and every trumpet player that moves the tongue up in the mouth unnecessarily to change the pitch is only serving to sabotage him or herself by reducing airflow and causing a worse timbre on the instrument. In this case, we could presumably conclude that anytime we use our tongues to change the pitch on the instrument, what we're really doing is inadvertently controlling one of the other factors involved in reaching higher notes on the trumpet. So perhaps by thinking that we're using our tongue, we're really altering slightly the aperture in our lips or the tension of our lips. This belief is held by some number of physicists as well as some brass educators, including Arnold Jacobs, who recommended keeping the tongue as low in the mouth as possible at all times. So can we conclude that so many brass educators throughout the world who advocate using tongue arch to change the registers of the trumpet are completely and hopelessly off base? Can we assume that so many great brass instrumentalists through the ages have allowed misinformation to cause them to use a completely inconvenient and cumbersome tongue position that only serves to reduce airflow and worsen their tone? Can we finally and conclusively lay to rest the idea that the tongue position has anything to do at all with the pitch of the instrument or changing registers? No, no we cannot. In my professional opinion, the tongue definitely has an effect on the pitch of the instrument and on changing registers, especially in the upper register. Now, is it the Venturi effect? Is it changing the resonance of our vocal tracts? Is it some third thing? I don't know. I'm not a physicist and I don't have the resources to do these kinds of studies. What I do know is that I am a professional trumpet player 
and I've been teaching trumpet for almost 20 years now, and the effect of thinking about the vowel sounds and the position of the tongue in the mouth has had a big impact on me and on many of my students. And if you had to ask me to put a wager down on whether I thought that so many brass educators and brass players uh, are constantly sabotaging themselves with a completely impractical tongue position, or if I thought it was more likely that the scientific community just has not been able to figure out specifically what's going on when the tongue is used to change registers, I will put my money on the idea that there is something happening and the tongue does have a pivotal role in changing registers, but that we just have not yet figured out what that is yet. Over the last several months while researching this topic, I've started to get really obsessive about the position of my tongue in my mouth while I'm playing. And I've really focused in on what I'm doing, where I feel the harmonic change happen in the registers with my tongue position. And I've done certain little experiments like playing on gigs, trying not to use my tongue at all, trying to keep my tongue in the lowest position possible. One thing that I found trying not to use my tongue while playing is it made playing much more difficult as I then had to use the other factors uh, in order to compensate for what I would otherwise naturally use my tongue for. Uh, another thing that is a consideration here, I'm going to do a little experiment here. Obviously this is all anecdotal, but uh, I, you know, I'm dealing with what is happening in my own head and uh, I've found that a lot of the time that this is helpful to my students to be able to reflect on what is going on in my own body. So. One thing that is fairly conclusive in the scientific community is that motion of the tongue will slightly change the pitch and slightly change the timbre. So you'll be able to hear that if I move my tongue around without changing the pitch. It might sound like this. Hopefully you can hear it easily. So even though I'm not changing notes, you can hear the timbre changing and you can hear the pitch changing very slightly on that one note. Now, if I continue to push the air at a steady level and continue to move my tongue up in my head, you'll notice where there's a certain break and it sounds like this. Now, in that instance, just to be clear, oftentimes we talk about the back of our tongues, but in that, what I'm feeling in my tongue is that my tongue is moving up in entirely in the same rate. So the tip of my tongue is still, you know, funneling that air towards the front of my mouth. It's not as though the back of my tongue is up, like I'm saying, guh, 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 or something like that, bringing my tongue up back here. It's really more like I'm reducing the space in my mouth entirely like this. Bringing my tongue up in my head, in reducing the space through which that air can move. Now, once again, I don't know what's going on. You know, it seems like it could be the Venturi effect, could be changing the resonance in my vocal tract, could be some other thing. But at the end of the day, it feels very clear to me as I move my tongue up in my head, you can hear that point where that register breaks and I move up into the next partial. <laughs> All I'm doing to change that register is so, that's specifically what it feels like. All right, what if I want to do a fast lip trill? How do I get that sound? Everything else remains the same. Is it possible I'm controlling my aperture, my orbicularis oris muscles in order to quickly change the position of my mouth? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, you know, it's possible. But the way that it feels to play, is and I can feel that air moving around in my mouth in a certain way. It goes like this. I'm gonna do it one more time. Ready? The other thing that you'll notice is that focusing on my tongue, I can move from the low register of the trumpet up into the upper register of the trumpet, and there's fairly minimal motion in the corners of my lips as I play. More or less, this stuff remains fairly static. Now, is stuff moving around? Yeah, my aperture is decreasing and the tension of my lips maintains. But at the end of the day, focusing on that airstream and on my tongue seems to be the most effective way for me to be able to jump registers on the trumpet. All right, how about this? Can I play a high C and maintain that while moving my tongue down in my head? Let's give it a shot. Just 
by trying to keep that high C going, anytime I move my tongue just slightly down to my head, all I'm doing there is and that move seems to necessarily bring that pitch down to that B flat rather than the high C. Again, is it possible that this subtle tongue motion that I think I'm doing is actually controlling some other part of my face? Yeah, it's possible, but it's extremely doubtful. I think a great summary of this whole tongue position to trumpet pitch issue came from another study at the University of New South Wales in Australia, who are apparently doing some amazing work in acoustics and the physics of sound. And in this study, researchers invented an artificial lip system and an artificial vocal tract in order to be able to attach this whole artificial system to a trombone to be able to control the various parameters that were affecting the pitch of the trombone to be able to study it more closely. Now, in this study, experimenting with different fake tongue positions, they concluded that the high tongue configuration with a constriction upstream from the valve played a somewhat higher pitch for most slide positions. However, it also caused the register transition to occur at a higher pitch. They also added that players are aware that tongue placement and other changes in the mouth configuration affect the intonation and also the transition between registers. And these measurements on an artificial playing system support such observations, as do some experiments we've done with live players. The details of how this works are subtle and not yet understood. So if you're looking to do a PhD in acoustics or the physics of sound and you want to try to tackle a classic problem in the brass world, consider doing some studies on what's happening in our mouths when we're playing brass instruments. I'd love to hear the results. Also, if you are confident that you know the answer to these questions and you can try not to come off like a tactless, arrogant blowhard, please send me an email because I'd love to learn more about the specifics of the way that the mouth works when changing pitches on the trumpet. It's become an obsession of mine for the last couple of months, and I'd be very interested to learn as much as I can about the subject going forward. And I would love to do a follow-up video in the future to correct the record and to be more specific about the mechanisms involved in playing the trumpet. If you are a trumpet player and you're looking to get better at the trumpet, my recommendation to you is to really listen to your body, feel out what it feels like to move around into the different registers on the trumpet and to create a beautiful timbre on the instrument. And most importantly, really listen to amazing trumpet players, listen to some great music and make it a regular part of your practice routine to tweak these little things and focus on what you're doing in order to coax a beautiful sound out of the trumpet and make some music that's gonna make some people happy. All right, gang, well, I had a lot of fun researching the physics of the trumpet for this episode. Once again, I found that the more that I learned, the more that I realized I didn't know, and in the process, I learned a lot, and it's been very interesting covering some of these subjects, and I hope that you have also had some fun coming along for the ride. If you like this video and you want to stay up with what we're doing, you can give us a like, subscribe to the channel, and you can find us on Patreon at the link in the description below for follow-up videos and to support the creation of new videos like this one. All right, gang, have a wonderful time practicing, and I will catch you on the next one. See ya. All right, friends, thanks so much for checking out this video. We hope it helps in your quest for the majesty of musical self-expression. If you like what we're doing here, you can give this video a like and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this one. And if you'd like to support the creation of new videos like this, you can become a subscriber on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Ridgewood School of Music. There, subscribers will have access to more in-depth follow-up videos, as well as solo transcriptions, various musical exercises, and all kinds of fun stuff. If you'd like to follow me on my musical adventures, you can find me on Instagram, at Bob Speltman. And you can follow the Ridgewood School of Music's other social media pages by following the links in the description below. The Ridgewood School of Music is currently accepting new students online or in person in the New York City area. If you're interested in lessons, you can find us at www.ridgewoodschoolofmusic.com or you can send us an email at ridgewoodschoolofmusic at gmail.com and we can set you up with a great teacher for the instrument and the style of music that you're interested in studying. All right, gang, well, have a wonderful time practicing and we'll catch you on the next one. See ya.